Cool. Well, yeah. Th thanks all. Welcome to the, uh, what, are, what are we at here? June 15th, uh, IPFS Implementers Working Group. We're glad you're all here. Uh, go ahead and add your name to the attendees list if you like, or and or add any uh, agenda items. So we've got this recording. Uh, let's see here. Um, we, we had, I know we had a couple of potentially, uh, yeah, yeah. So a couple of things on the agenda besides what's happening with implementations around the HTTP, so HTTP path and multi adders, some updates on the uh, Galapagos CAD DHT, and maybe we'll give Lytle a chance to give an update on, to add some IPIP things. Again, we're all running from another, another meeting. But maybe we'll just start off uh, on implementation updates. This is not required, but anyone who wants to share or give visibility into what's been happening, any particularly if it might be useful for others to know, um, that would be uh, that that'd be great. So we can we can start with that. I can take the first two. Sorry, I'll, I'll get some notes in afterwards. Uh, on the on the Helia front, not a lot to share other than, again that like the JSIPFS repo itself is like now fully archived. Um, and yeah, so we have kind of redirected everyone over to repo or sorry, over to Helia, the, the NPM modules, et cetera, all, all make it clear. And, you know, HackFS is going on right now where we've been actively engaging in people who are trying to use Helia for their projects and using that as a source of, uh, feedback, et cetera, but no, like no major in-flight initiative at the moment that I have to share is something that's recently landed. Um, so that's where we are on the, on the Helia front. And yeah, so on, on Kubo, again, I'll get links in here afterwards. Uh, we cut the, I guess, a second RC yesterday for 021. I expect that release will go out on, uh, on, on Monday. And gosh, I'm drawing a blank on some of the key features that we even have uh, in there. I guess Hugo or Dean, or sorry, uh, Lytle or Dean, anything you want to call out? We can pull up the release notes. Um, we'll, put it, we'll put it in afterwards. I don't know if there's... Yeah, I guess some of the IPIPs are actually getting implemented there, which will allow us to close those IPIPs. Uh, maybe I'll circle back to that if I were last um, you want to go. Or go, go ahead, can, and Lytle. Yeah, I, 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 I guess like uh, I can like send you a link if you want to screen share or I'll paste in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, the change log is here. Um, the, there are gateway items here and I can speak to them. Uh, one, it's possible to disable the serialized responses. So if you want to run just trustless gateway and don't be uh, responsible for contributing to phishing campaigns without having to set up CSP headers or dealing with all that, there's a, now a single flag in Kubo. You flip that and you only do cars and blocks. Uh, but if you do the serialized responses, uh, now we also provide a huma humane <laughs> preview of Daxibor. Uh, just like we render a preview of UnixFS directory, we generate HTML. If your browser, uh, if your user agent speaks text HTML uh, and sends that in uh, accept header, we now will return uh, a preview of uh, Daxibor and Daxjson. Um, and we also support uh, IP402, those partial cars. Uh, which enable light clients to do uh, things like smart range requests for blocks for a specific uh, byte ranges of the specific entity. And it's uh, for UNIXFS today, but the way it's designed is de facto like format agnostic, as long as it's IPLD, uh, as long as Gateway can speak uh, IPLD and extract bytes from entity, it will work. So it's kind of future proof. Uh, those are like gateway things, and for people who talk with Kubo using uh, Go library, the uh, RPC client now lives in Kubo itself, so that will make uh, maintenance easier for everyone because you know the version uh, in Kubo repo is always compatible with the Kubo itself. Cool thing. Thanks, Lytle, for filling in. Appreciated. You want to go, Hannah? Share about Lassie. Yeah, just two two brief things. One is that we are we're not quite there, but we will have probably by the next time this meeting happens, full IP IP four hundred two and IP actually IP IP four twelve compliance. Um, and another thing that's cool is we are now doing verified. We've been using the IP of 
IP IP 402 stuff as a client uh, and doing uh, verified HTTP transfer with uh, dot storage at scale. And then that mixes with bit swap and graph sync requests. So it's kind of cool that a, it is a multi-protocol retrieval client that is seems to be working. So yeah, for the moment, sort of working. Uh, working is the strong word. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Good, good, good stuff. Brandon, you want to share on Iro? Yeah, I mean, more, also that's more than good, Hannah. That's incredible. Congrats! I think your team should be very pumped. Um, uh, for us, we I think it'd be fun to just celebrate that we our team has been working on a hole punching solution, which I think would be really relevant and interesting to this group. Uh, we we took a different approach than libp2p, but I think our results are going to be exciting and interesting and comparable. I post a link to an SVG. Uh, can you click that, Steve? Absolutely. For some, like, this is like a, I, A, who knew that SVGs could be movies? Uh, but like, this is uh, an example of uh, a two nodes behind NATS trying to exchange different packets between each other. So we spent, spent a bunch of time setting up and building infrastructure to actually do observability in both simulated networks and real networks. Uh, if you pause this thing for a second, Steve, and then hover over one of these dots, that like the green dot near the iro provide sucker you get all of the contents of that packet which has been a very real amount of work to actually figure out how to unwrap all the tls around all of this because these are encrypted um, but we have a really great simulation uh framework for understanding how our hole punching system works we now have hole punching landed on main uh one of the big distinctions that we or uh, sort of deviations we took is using these things called a derper which is based on the tail scale approach um and the that but that does mean using relays for as like one of your default methods of establishing fast connections and this demonstration shows how many packets are actually flowing through the derper ideally we're getting like four flowing through that and then a direct connection established between the two nodes but some fun research happening on that uh we're looking forward to publishing more of this and more of our findings around how this how effective this is or is not and also if anyone has any questions about the observability tools that we've built to try and understand the nightmare that is establishing connections between devices directly on the internet <laughs> we're happy to chat we, we have uh, our whole team has spent more than three months working on this uh it, it was a twenty-two thousand line pr when it landed um it's been a lot of work so and we're happy to be happy to chat about hole punching happy to compare hole punching notes uh, we did read actively from the hole punching campaign that the probe lab team put out and so uh it'd be great to see if I, we can at some point uh, gather our findings once we ship this into a production release and just see how it stacks up. Um, yeah, so that's where I was at. We've been, we've said we had to ship four major things. This is the third and content routing being the fourth. Um, yeah, I think that's our big update. Cool. Th thanks a lot, Brennan, for sharing. I'm sure there's probably lots of questions on this one. I guess I, first off, I want to like appreciate sharing, even though like, hey, don't have this all, um, you know, polished or like a report out yet just to get people visibility that, that it's there. Um, yeah, I don't want people to feel like everything has to look pristine before they can start talking about it. So I, yeah, mm -hmm. like, like, like that, um, I guess, I, is it is it fair to assume that at some point in the weeks ahead, there will be more of a kind of a cleaned up presentation? Of like, yeah, or like these yeah. are the problems. It, when we evaluated the landscape, these are the problems that we saw not being satisfactorily met, which is why we ended up doing all this engineering work. Yeah, totally. And we can talk about that at length. I, I don't want to, I definitely don't want to like uh, derail a implementers call into a whole bunch of conversation, but I, I mainly wanted to signal that we're available and can chat about that. Um, and we can totally talk about it. I, and I think what exactly to your point, Steve, is a, a more detailed um, description of the approach that we took, uh, because this isn't, this is really a connection between quick and a simulation of a socket, a magic socket underneath that is dynamically switching its connectivity. Uh, and so, yeah, we'd be happy to talk about that. Um, Maybe we'll find we got it. We need we owe a description of that, and then we'll um, and then <laughs> hopefully that'll answer a lot of the basic questions. But if folks have async questions they want to ask in chat, I can chat with it. Chat about it. Cool. The, the, Brandon, yeah, I might be. I mean, I think everyone in this audience would probably be really interested in it. Uh, so I guess it's a question of whether we create time for it here or a separate form, or if we just do it async, or maybe I guess also probably a lot of the libp2p community would be really interested in it too. So I don't know. I got, I don't know, Mark, which would it be makes us to invite to like having a whole whole punching focused talk at the libp2p community call or I, know, I guess we can talk about it offline, but 
would love to get this shared more for people. Yeah, I, I feel like that could be a good venue for it. Um, yeah, the community call seems like a really good spot. Uh, if the timing works, that that seems awesome. Everyone there, I know I have a ton of questions, so I, I think everyone there has a lot of questions and want to learn more. Awesome. Then let's try to think about uh, someone. I think either Casey or Dick from our team would be the best to talk about it. Um, and so we can be delighted to join the Peter P. call. Yeah, yeah, we could probably record that too. So folks who can't make it can, can also watch it. Cool. Okay. Th well, uh, th thanks. I'll finish filling in the note here. But any other implementation updates that anyone wants to share? Okie doke. Um, I guess do do we maybe want to quickly go through the IP? Let are you okay if we quickly do the IP IP corner just um, bef mm -hmm. before we get into our longer discussions on the other okay. stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that will be brief. Uh, uh, so just flagging uh, those two IPs which I flagged last week for final review. Uh, now is the time <laughs> for a last veto. I assume everyone is okay with them. So. Uh, after this call, I'll merge them. Uh, the the streaming uh, and the delegated IPNS uh, uh, will, will that we either already have implementation in Kubo uh, shipping, or we will have uh, it in CID.contact as well. Uh, those are not very controversial, so those two uh, most likely will land. Um, and that flags about two upcoming ones, uh, 402 and 412. Those are uh, IPIPs about uh, partial and order cars. Um, on the first one, we are nearly ready for a like, final ratification call, but there's an unresolved uh, topic of when I return a car from a gateway, what should be in the roots header? It's not HTTP header. The car format itself has roots. Uh, it's a list. In theory, it could be empty, but some software may break if it's empty. Uh, historically, Kubo and, um, always returned the terminating element, and that's how we implemented it in Kubo uh, 021 RC, which I mentioned before. Uh, but the thread is there if you have, for example, if you have implementation which would like to do streaming and would like to not resolve path before you uh, populate this header. Uh, maybe you want it empty. Uh, you know, there's a, there are technical problems in ecosystem, and I feel we are not ready for uh, saying that this is, this is ready for ratification. So I'd say in two weeks, I hope to resolve this thing. Uh, for it's not blocking Kubo because we did not change the production behavior in Kubo, so we always return the terminating element. But for use cases which needs streaming and better performance. Uh, this is an open uh, issue. And for ordered cars, it's just flagging that it's most likely and we will uh, close, uh, also wrap up uh, remaining discussions and then in two weeks, we'll try to ratify it. Uh, we will also try uh, within the next two weeks to have conformance tests for finished for both and applied uh, to the IPIPs. So in the IPIP, the CIDs, um, can be used by implementers for implementation. Uh, and there's a bunch of um, routing V1, uh, the delegated routing over HTTP improvements. Uh, we have uh, IPIPs open for all three types of routing, content routing, IPNS is the one we'll be lending. Uh, there's also peer routing, which we don't have, uh, uh, we did not like fill it up, but it's a placeholder one. and and. We also have streaming, and there's a conversation about puts, where we do um, puts over H HTTP put to the routing system. They are in the in progress column. There's too many of them to <laughs> go over. I was just flagging that if you are interested in those topics. Uh, also, ambient discovery of content routers, but I feel we need to make uh, content routers useful first, um, and then we can discover them. <laughs> so everything is in this column. Uh, yeah, and I, I believe that's it. Thank, thanks, Lytle. Any IPIP questions? What what would you constitute as making content routers useful? Uh, am I able to announce my content to a content router? 
And finding content doesn't count as useful? Sure, but who can do, announce it? People guess, who know I magical incantations. <laughs> As two things, I feel like there's two there's two big use cases that that fall out of this. One is like, I'm in a browser. I'm not really serving any bytes here anyway. Uh, how do I fetch stuff? And the other is I'm writing a new implementation in Python, and I do not want to implement all this stuff. Can I ask someone else to please do this work for me? In the meanwhile, uh, and that, that guy needs puts. Um, I think those are kind of like those are the two lenses I sort of look at that problem from right i mean i i think i'm just trying to point out that we've already got a significant fraction of content in the network that is available through content routing uh and not in the dht or so forth and so thinking about how we discover that is already pretty valuable yeah i, I don't disagree uh i just feel it and it's also like my personal probably preference given the use cases i care about would be to make it possible for people to have uh you know full read write content routing possibility over http um and once we have that then the floodgates of uh, uh you know those uh, endpoints can open but we get for sure we can work on both in parallel it's just kind of, kind of a matter of prioritization if you are a single person that want to contribute time to both uh probably i would spend time on uh, closing the gaps before making it widely available I, I i think like my my hesitation has been that i'm not sure that a normal ipfs node necessarily wants to use anything other than the dht for its puts like i think the dht is actually well suited to many of the individual running kubo nodes right that they're you know if, if you're running a kubo instance that is changing its ip because you're on a home network and doing things like that having regular republishing as the way that we expire things and and having that go through a non-incentivized network of peers is actually like a pretty good fit um and so like and and that is uh to to a level where it's like should should an http like what what http instance are we imagining setting up that we would want to have be this put uh router because it's unclear that it's the the central ipni ish database variant that would even want to support this and so given that i see that put route we can specify it but who's implementing it and how long and like that may just take a long time before we find like like who is the implementer that we're imagining even if we specify it i guess is what i'm wondering because that's I unclear mean, to me i mean there's a project in ipni ecosystem which is using puts in kubo and we had bugs on that last week so i'm kind of confused you're saying you should they should not do that the the shim that we made for large publishers runs an ongoing long-lived http provider and expects that pub, that sidecar of kubo to be stable so so there is a set of sort of large-lived kubo nodes that may well want to have that it's fairly inefficient right now i think it would be a great thing to uh figure out how we can do puts that don't have to sort of re put every 24 hours that is not one large kubo nodes that have found themselves as large kubo nodes and can't do the migration really want either um but that's not like a like like i don't know if that protocol of going to a sidecar that you're also running yourself is uh like like splitting your kubo into two pieces is that what we're standardizing no, I'm just speaking about HTTP API. Kubo just implements a client. But um, but like I, realistically, I, right? The question is, as I, I sort of look at it as like the I'm writing the thing in Python thing is like how how do I get how do I get some of the functionality, but like I I've I've delegated some responsibility out to another module, whether it's because I want to do microservices or because I'm writing in a language and I don't want to use FFI or or whatever. Um I think it's important to have like who what are the drivers here, right? If the driver is well, we have people who are running the sidecar next to Kubo, then we should make sure that they have some standard thing they're operating on. If they need to start doing something else, then we should figure out how to get them to do something else. Yeah, maybe like a question I would ask, uh, and just to kind of like wrap this up would be like priority wise, 
do you feel uh, will uh, are puts above or below uh, ambient discovery as a wide topics? For me, I suspect we run into ambient discovery first because we're expecting pretty soon that all of the, for instance, Saturn nodes will be able to answer gets. And so now you've got a few thousand cached endpoints. And so you'd like your Kubo node to be able to go to the close one. I think the, the second part of that is there will be partners coming online. Uh, so it's not just a SID.contact. And so we'd like to get that reliability where you're not stuck with a single centralized provider and have uh, you know, you you see who's online as they as they come online and are providing uh, content routing. Um, so both of those are things that I think we do expect to see before too long. Um, and so then, and and so that is development work that I believe is on the IPNI team's roadmap. Versus if put isn't, then let's find a counterparty because otherwise I don't know where that roadmap is. Where we have that, I guess, is why I'm liking that. Okay, thanks. So I think good good discussion. Is there anything more anyone wants to say on this topic? Okay. Um, yeah. Good. I mean, so good. Good call. Th th thanks, Will. Uh, so I mean, yeah. Take so take away there is like yeah. It, let's say Andres IPFS stewards drive forward. Um, you know the put aspect of delegated routing. It's great you know from your point of view it's showing up in implementations like ipni is going to be dependent on who actually really needs that um which is like yeah fair 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 call out okay well let um i'll, I'll move on here because i know we we had we want to circle back here on the http path uh multi, sorry multi-adder uh, aspect do you are you okay to lead this one marco yeah sure uh, do you want to share? Just click that. I, I can sure. also share if you think that's yeah, better. Whatever is easiest for you. Whatever. Um, if you want to be driving, I'm happy to let you share. Okay. Uh, how about you just click for now, since okay. I don't have this open yet. Cool. Cool. So just to refresh people's memory, I, I uh, well, I managed to trim this down to less than 100 lines. So I, I think that's pretty nice. Um, but just to refresh people's memory, we're talking here about the the multi-adder and what it means to have an http component at the end of the multi-adder um, and so this pr documents that like from the pdp perspective we want the http component to mean that this node is capable of speaking some http transport uh, and, and and that's basically it. And that this HTTP transport doesn't accept parameters. It's just like, hey, I have an HTTP server here. You can talk to me via an HTTP client. Uh, then there's a recommendation on how you do like app, uh, application specific things. Although like this kind of becomes more complicated when you have multiple transports because all these transports can do HTTP semantics. Uh, what does it mean to have like application specific stuff on top of a transport? But there is a recommendation if, if you want to do this. I think what IPNI does, I'm pretty sure kind of fits into this recommendation. It's just that like the my app component that I added here in the recommendation is really just the custom like HTTP path thing. And so it's uh it's it's good that it already fits there. Um but yeah, this is this is uh any any I don't know if anyone has like has any questions for me. So if there's any questions, we can we can talk about it. I guess is there anything unclear about what I've said so far that people would want to want me to explain a bit more about? And really I'm trying to avoid talking about like how the PDP integrates with this because this will all be defined in, in, in like another specs. Uh, and this is more just saying like, HTTP is a transport when it's at the end of this multi-adder, and then we're going to do something with this transport. Great. 
But if people want like a hint at what's coming up, I'm happy to go into that. I, I, I just pasted like an example, maybe like practical example. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my understanding is that like uh, the way uh, IPNI returns uh, provider addresses right now mm -hmm. uh, is like conformant with this approach because yes, it just it's correct. It just shows that hey, on this TCP port, there's HTTPS, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. Oh, is this the fun one where the provider ID uh, ends in HTTP? I can't see it. Looks like it. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Easter egg. <laughs> yeah. Well, so oh, this is like gnarly. missing. It's like, right, so like in that example, this is like missing the application. Like there should be in some metadata somewhere there, the application context that tells you like, this is the protocol you're speaking. Once you've reached the ident like the the endpoint, which is this HTTP like node, like yeah. So the protocol here's the, here's would... the path, and here's the like here's the path, and here's the semantics of the thing that you should be expecting to do. Yeah. So if I I'm it's kind of hard to read this JSON thing, but right. um, yeah. there's like a protocol field here. And I assume this can also be used for the HTTP. Right now, it's just unknown for the HTTP thing, which I guess like the application knows to infer this as like a, there's some HTTP API we can use here. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is where like the application specific stuff would go, like inside that protocol field, just how it is in the other one where it's like we can do graph sync or uh, it yeah, doesn't say here, but I assume bit swap would be an option as well. Yeah, there's a bit soft one down below, but yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a rela related thread on uh, IPIP about P routing, uh, the placeholder of that. Um, maybe like easier to see. Yeah. So so right now, the the production example we we, we looked at was uh, one where which had protocol and schema no. And what we want to do is to kind of like clean that up in the case where you don't know the protocol, but you know this peer has it, may have mm -hmm. like has this data, but we don't know protocols, or maybe you we have more than bit swap. And that will be the case with uh, now more and more peers speaking this uh, trustless gateway protocol exchange protocol, speaking both bit swap and this, and you choose whichever is faster, easier, cheaper for you. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought the protocol was a list, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so that's <laughs> that's kind of like the problem. The the response was designed around oh, the peer speaks only one protocol, which mm -hmm. was yeah. So we are trying as part of this IPIP about delegating peer routing. We also want to introduce a schema for peer, which is around a peer and not around a protocol. And that way, we will have a single response per peer. Uh, may not be, you know, there may be cases where you will sent uh, multiple ones and frame response around protocol. But I feel in the cases when you are doing DHT proxying or things like that over this API, this one uh, will be more efficient because you know uh, the, the DHT proxy has a peer store and it may have multiple addresses. It may have information about protocols for some peers and for some it may only know peer ID, but it's still useful information. So it's kind of like progressive. The, the you get as much information as, as possible. Yeah, and, and if you like, don't really uh, know the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and it's like IP draft, so totally I mentioned it because we need more eyes and more opinions on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can always do an identify worst case if you don't know the protocols. Which I guess maybe relates to the lib P2P. How, how do I want to do identify when there are HTTP protocols involved? Yeah, there's uh, oh, there's a PR now that talks about this, but this is more on like the lib P2P HTTP stuff. Like how is lib P2P use HTTP transport? Right now we're thinking of having like a dot well-known lib P2P resource where it can return a JSON file and you can parse that and it tells you like what protocols and where they're mounted on. Thanks, Marco. So, yeah, I guess anyone, any concerns here, any contention points? Is there any like 
one way doors that we're walking through that people are worried about? Um, can I jump in? I think, yeah. Yeah. I've been like playing back to the counter arguments in my head, I'm trying to get like get to the headspace of this. Um, it's starting to make more and more sense to me. And so to like mm -hmm. say out loud some of the cart, the, the arguments that I, or the uh, methodology of which I got to the conclusion. For me personally, I feel like I agree with the way that you've skip, uh, set things up, Marco. Um, last week, last time we met, I had concerns around like, well, HTTP is a really big, hairy, complex thing. And like having it in a multi address is gnarly. But like HTTP has its own inbuilt version negotiation, right? And so you just say, hey, delegate to the HTTP protocol to figure out what version of HTTP you're speaking. And if you say HTTPS, then we're, it has its own TLS negotiation as part of it. That's actually well specified, right? And so, like, I think it is some of my concerns there. We're just kind of misplaced on the basis that this is actually handled, right? <laughs> we can type HTTP in a browser with some functions. Um, and so, like, I think if you if the language just either articulates that, or uh, maybe I'll just say that out loud, and that's how I'll satisfy my own curiosity. Uh, the other thing I think uh, might be nice, a metaphorical support for your argument, Marco is the having the dns or the multi-editor end in https kind of finishes this sort of like uh metaphorical bridge to, to thinking about it as everything to the left of the https scheme in a browser and that sort of helps me understand why because in my brain like seeing https at the end of something doesn't make much sense but then when you sort of really think about what multi-addresses are trying to do they're trying to scaffold you up to a lot of the things that the browsers are just doing for you by default. Um, and so it's starting to make more and more sense to me. And I think uh, personally, I have both through your adjusted language and my own uh, thinking through it properly <laughs> and not on a live recorded call. I, I think I've landed in the same place. I think it makes a lot of sense. Cool, cool. That's good to hear. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion with this PR. Like if you see it's like 74 uh, comments. So so yeah, I think I think there has been like, a lot of like evolution here and like tweaking the, the exact language and like the first example uh of the multi-adder is actually the dns example.com https thing and like yeah there was some back and forth there but it's like no i mean an http client can take this information and establish an http connection on that that's really all you need yeah it makes sense to me thanks dude yeah, th thanks, Marco. So, I mean, two weeks. So, two weeks ago, you know, Lytle, you've you've raised this one just to make uh, make sure people are aware and that we didn't start publishing um, you know, multi adders that were going to cause compatibility problems and stuff, et cetera, later. But it, at that, sorry, from our vantage point now, does it look like we have resolved that and we've got all related parties and uh, aligned here? Is there anyone not represented that we need to get this message out to? I I I think it's like a sensible compromise because um, it's also like my understanding is it's not it, it was not not like extremely necessary. It, it it's it's the usual problem uh, that people who are introduced to multi others and are familiar with URLs and they have HTTP URL. Uh, hit probably the first like 15 minutes. Uh, our ecosystem was very efficient at avoiding <laughs> answering this question for eight years or more. <laughs> and we finally, I, I guess we we grew enough that we finally had to like write something down. Uh, and I feel like having something written down is better than uh, ambiguity. So um, I, I don't know, Will, does it like sounds acceptable? On your end. Cool. Cool. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Well, thank, thank you. We will, we will move on. So, Guy, you want to take the floor? Cool. Thanks, folks. Yeah. Thanks, Marco. So, uh, next topic um, is about the PhD. So, um. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm doing a new implementation of a DHT and I wanted to do a demo tonight, but I ended up working on other stuff this week <laughs> and so it isn't ready. So I'm just going to explain. 
So um, how we got there? So the DHT is one of the main pillars of IPFS. It's not the only one, but it's an important one. And the code, the code base has been neglected for a long time. And the result is that it's very hard to read for newcomers just to join and understand what's going on. Um, there's a lot of tests that are flaky and that we cannot correct because uh, the code, uh, the, the way the code base is built is um, it's highly concurrent. And so it's basically non-deterministic. And so tests will fail for some reason we don't know. And so we just have to run the test many times and it's a pain. Um, it's very hard to debug. Um, so yesterday we've spent the day with, uh, with Hugo just to chase a bug. And turns out that when it's that, uh, that concurrent, it's very hard to find and there are not a lot of logging and so on. And it's also very hard to implement new features on top of what we already have. So from the start, so it wasn't a plan from the start to build a new implementation and refactor everything. The plan was uh, for me to build the um, double hash DHT on top of what we already have. And it turns out the change was so huge and it's not possible to debug that a, fact, uh, a refactor was required anyway. And so Marco and other people suggested that um, it would be a great idea to have a sequential DHT, so to have a sequential execution making, making it deterministic. And so it would allow us to have much uh, easier debuggability. Um, also to um, uh, have some tests and have a good test coverage and make sure that um, everything is as it should be. Because every time somebody is looking at the, the code base, we find new bugs and it shouldn't be normal. And uh, also it makes it would make it very easy to simulate because if we have a second troll execution, we don't need test ground anymore to make complicated simulation. We could just run it sequentially and we would know exactly what is supposed to happen next. And so that's um, kind of the goal. So making the execution second troll, which means that it would be kind of single threaded, not exactly, because if you've used uh, LPTP, you know that every time you send a message you need, or in Go, I mean, um, it opens a new Go routine. And so you need any way to um, have multiple threads. But to have, um, it's possible to have a, a sequential execution. So that's um, what guides uh, the, the new implementation. And it's not possible to take what we already have and to uh, make it single threaded. So uh, yeah, that's, that's why it's going to be a new implementation. And the goal is to uh, also split um, the IPFS part from the LIP2P part, because now the DHT lives in um, LIP2P. But actually, it's the IPFS DHT. It's doing provider records, and it's doing a lot of IPFS-only stuff. And um, it shouldn't be the case, because somebody that is willing just to use DP2P should be able to do so without having uh, IPNS and provider records and so on already embedded. They shouldn't have to maintain their own fork. And it should be easy to implement new features on, on, top, of, on top of it. So let me. Uh, can I share my screen quickly? Or if you have any question at any point, feel free to interrupt. All right, so that's um, just draw a whiteboard. Can you, everyone see my screen? Um, I just drew, uh, a, a whiteboard to explain a bit the design of, of the code. And so as we want to have a single threaded execution, even though the queries need to be in a way multi-thread because you don't want to hang until the, the, the query you've sent, uh, the request comes back. So what we need to do is just, okay, so if I send a message, uh, I will send it and then I go to the next action. And as soon as the message comes back, um, it will generate a new event. So one of the central points of this implementation is a scheduler because we need just to 
uh, execute the action one after another. No, no uh, new go routine for every single action. And so uh, the scheduler will allow us to do so. And it's composed of an even queue, which is just, okay, which action do I have to execute right now? And what's the order of these actions? And I'll, I'll take them one after another. And also we need, um, I call it a planner, but our scheduler is just that for some events such as timeout or uh, sometimes on uh, tickers. Um, so we want to have the possibility to have a timeout, even though there's not uh, a go routine waiting for uh, the timeout. Or for instance, when we refresh the routing table every every so often, we also need to have like an alarm that says, hey, you have to refresh it now. And so that's what the planner is for. And so the scheduler, scheduler will just tell you, okay, um, now there's those actions you gotta run or you're good. Uh, you have nothing else to run for now. And the spirit is to make every bit uh, replaceable so that if somebody wants to implement a multi-thread uh, scheduler that for every single action pops a new go routine or that limits the number of go routine, it's totally possible to replace the scheduler implementation because it's just an interface and you, you can build any, any module um, any kind of scheduler. So that was for the scheduling. Another important point is the message endpoint. So it's how the DHT node will communicate with, with each other. So for instance, lip 2 p is one possible message endpoint, but uh, it's also possible when I want to do a simulation, for instance, I want to test um, all the rest of the implementation and I don't care about the networking part, then I can run the simulation locally on my computer. So I can have a fake endpoint that's going to dispatch the messages from one node to another within the same um, uh, program execution. Or it can be anything. It can be, um, for instance, uh, also a UDP uh, message endpoint or whatever, you can just replace it by anything. But so in the case of IPFS, it will be lip 2 p um, The routing table is also a pretty central element um, of a DHT. And so again, so it's just, so it's an interface and it's possible to implement it um, uh, as, as people want, uh, or tailored to the need of the application. For instance, um, for IPFS, we can have like, one routing table that would be normal. We can have, so the pool RT, the accelerated DHT, is just another implementation of a routing table. Or we can have a partial RT or a routing table where um, we take in priority the peers that are um, close to us uh, from a ping distance point of view, in addition to the bucket metrics, um, and so on. So it's possible to have uh, any kind of routing table here. Um, then one important component. So uh, the, the elements you can see on the right hand side are the generic ones, those that can be lip P2P, but anyone can build their own module so they can live everywhere. But let's say the interfaces would live in the lip P2P land. And the last one, which is very central, is the query, which is uh, when I want to look up for a peer or for a provider record or whatever. Um, it's the uh, iteration that gets me from where I am to closer and closer to the node that is storing the provider record or to the node if I'm uh, looking for a node. And so this one is using uh, the scheduler, of course, uh, the message endpoint to communicate with other peers and the routing table to know uh, where to look at. And so it's just going to dispatch some event to the scheduler that's going to execute them when um, it gets the control. And then, um, so let's say more the application part. So if we take IPFS as an example, we can build any RPC on top of the query. So for instance, if I want to do a find peer, um, then it's really easy. I just need to look up for a specific key and say, okay, stop when you find a peer that corresponds to this specific key. Or if I want to do a find provider records, um, I can do exactly the same. So the provider records has a key in the Academy space. I can look it up and when I find it or 
if there if I find that nobody is providing it, then the query can stop. Same for IPNS. And so, for instance, if we take double hashing, it will just be uh, one more bubble here, so one more RPC, but it's building on what we already have. And then in order to answer to the request, uh, we just need a server um, yeah, that would listen to the message endpoint and reply to, to uh, any request. So yeah, that's for the main architecture. And yeah, don't know if it's really relevant. So uh, the I don't have a working demo yet, but so that's the, um, I've added some tracing um, inside of it. And so that's what we can see. So the events are not necessarily important and I didn't really filter out, but so it's really easy to debug because we can see uh, the action uh, executed one after the other. So for instance, here we have a, a scenario with three peers. So we we see that we are adding the peers to the routing table, then we are creating a query. Um, so within the query, we are looking for the closest peers that we already know in the routing table. Um, and then I think, it's, uh, yes, exactly. And so here, uh, we can see that we select one of the peers and then uh, we send it a request and then the request comes back a bit later and so we handle the response and we, we can see what's inside and so it's very easy to debug. So I guess that was it for um, presentation. Now I'm happy to open the discussion if you have any question on the design or any comment, any recommendation or things you want to see in this new implementation. I like the tracing. Show me more of that. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I mean, we, we can add anything and it's it, it's good because we can follow, as the execution is second control, we can really um, follow every single step and understand what's wrong or if something has gone wrong, we can exactly understand where and how. I guess maybe one thing is that the the queries them like the things that go into the query, like the query types, might care about let's call them like you know partial state or how things are evolving. So there's like probably some callback between these things to know like when do I want to call it quits. Right, providers might only care about a certain number of providers or quality of providers. Find peer because of the wacky RPC. You might as well just wait around until you actually connect to the peer mm -hmm. and get the signed peer record directly from them, and you're already connected to them, and everything is all done. Uh, rather than 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 sort of a more normal approach you would use for a key value lookup. Um, so there's nothing wrong. It's just it's just like I guess the arrows are logically going this way, but there's like a little bit of a callback in there. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. So it's just, I did it like in two minutes, but yeah. I'm using the same logic as is already used in the current DHT. So I'm giving just a pointer on a function that will be run on the, on the result, on the response. So the query will keep a state that is generic and that so the, the caller, so the RPC can interact with through a, a function pointer. I think that makes sense. Probably like a code. I, I believe you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just one question from my side. Uh, I think I uh, asked this in one of the Notion documents. And so so this de deterministic and sequential ordering here um, seems so obvious. And also the, the consensus in, in the chat seems to be like, okay, this is the way to go. But still, what uh, could could you anticipate some drawbacks um, down the road of doing things like this, or maybe yeah. performance wise? Because what we're doing is we're building a multi-thread application, and we want it to run it a single thread. So what we want to do is actually manage the thread by ourselves, so that we control what's happening, and we totally we're in control, and we understand. And so it means that we may be less efficient than the operating system to 
schedule the different threads. And so we may lose in performance if performance is really important. So if you're running only one DHT and you're making loads of queries, then I think you'll notice a difference. But if you're running Kubo and the DHT is only one, one of the side thing that is running, um, I'm not sure we'll notice a lot of difference performance-wise. It's probably a little bit like the event loop pattern where like the event loop is fine. And then if you realize that like some queries, it's like, oh no, those extra few milliseconds are clogging up the event loop. Then you realize you need a refactor, but like probably you're not there unless you're getting like ridiculous numbers of events, which yeah. for a networking You'd be, thing, you'd be surprised. You know. Yeah, you, particularly with the number of peers. Um, you definitely want to throw a tracker on it, but it's really, it's actually really easy to measure that throw tracing on your loop and just keep track of iterations and you're good. Uh, the other thing that to make your argument for you, uh, this is the actor model, right? You're just, the scheduler is an actor. And you are, what you're saying here is you, you want to be able to have some, the determinism, it confused me to no end because I was like, there's a network involved. There's no determinism here. There's no total ordering. But you're talking about the total ordering of the way that we accommodate, accommodate manage the state machine and have that be completely separate from the network layer, right? And that's the win that you're getting here. The, the reason that you should dismiss people saying performance problems is the network call, like we've, we're dealing in latencies in tens of milliseconds. The processing time on how I manage the state mutations is not the problem, right? It's how long it takes people to respond. And so it's a slow scheduler isn't going to be your issue. Pardon the sorry. Yep. But this is just the way it should be. Do this. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> this is a lot of work. <laughs> I have a question and uh, have you noticed like, I, I don't know how much you've built here, but have you noticed like a, that you've had to think about like bounding all your work more? Like, is this more in the forth forefront of your mind? Cause I feel like, especially in Go, it's kind of easy to just like ignore this. And I'm curious if this like forces you to think about it more. So we know what? Oh, like bounding the amount of work that you're trying to do at any given time. Because you, because you're always concerned about, am I blocking the event loop? So like, you're always trying to make sure that like you're limiting the work that happens there. So that's sort of the question, right? Yeah. 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 So, so for now, the only thing that will, um, let's say grow the number of ongoing events is the query because you want to send multiple messages for the same query at the same time. And so there, there's a limit there. So it's a user-defined limit that you can say, okay, I want the concurrency factor to be this much. And also I think we can limit uh, to the total number of um, in-flight messages, uh, regardless of the number of queries. Well, I'm I'm seeing we're uh, yeah close close to time here. So th thanks, Keith, for you know, for, for sharing, and certainly in the ghost side of the world, excited to see this uh, you know to to emerge. I'm sure more more to come on this one, but thanks for giving people insight of what's happening. Uh, there was a yeah you know, if time parking lot around cars in Blake three. Um, I know I just, you know we, we won't get to that one now. Maybe I guess what next did you put you put that one down, Adine? I did because I was like talking with Brendan about it and figure there would get some time. We could just set up a separate time for people who are interested to chat about that. Yeah, I was I would let's love to be part of that discussion. Let's invite Hannah. Like, yeah. <laughs> let's definitely invite Hannah. On my own, that. I was like just randomly spending a lot of time in my head. <laughs> I would love to not spend it in my head. Can we just sort of as a high 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 level? We'll take one minute here. The theory is to talk about adapting the car spec to speak the bow format that Iris speaks so that we can do big blocks instead of cars. And the Dean has a draft that oh, and Hannah, we've, well, we've yeah, had a conversation I'm about I'm curious if you came to the same independent idea I had, which was just use one of the special bits in the car V2 to say all the bows will be, all the blank threes will be encoded in bow. Um, I didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't what I went with, but it doesn't really like, I guess the Doesn't point matter. is more like we need to, I, there are a thousand ways to write the spec. I don't really care as long as we all get the things that we need out of it without making it ballooning complexity. Yeah. Um, so let's schedule a call. We should yeah. post about it in IPFS implementers on the Filecoin Slack. 
Um, and if anybody wants to join, there will be an announcement there from one of the three of us, and we can schedule it there. Sound good? That's good. That was great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Ciao for now. Bye-bye.